in Tacitus's Annales, he wrote, Urbem Romam a principio rege savere libertatem et consultem Lucius Brutus institutit, dictatore ad tempusum ebantur, neque decem realis potestas ot rabienum, neque tribanor militum consolare ius divu aluit. And this means, it is said that the Roman city had kings from the beginning. Lucius Brutus emplaced freedom and the consulate. Dictatorships were held at times, neither were the decemvirs able to be on, uh, able to go beyond two years, nor was the consular justice of the military tribune strong at all times. And in my previous video, I touched on the life of Romulus. And before his story is buried by the rest, there is one interesting note that one of my friends introduced me to. It, this being that Lupa was assumed to be an epithet for a prostitute. I thought, I, I consider this pretty interesting. You know, both as the, the ramifications of, um, you know, what this would mean for the story, you know, taken in by a mother who couldn't have her own children type thing, like, or, uh, I guess you could say she tried constantly but never could, and then she was able to raise them. But uh, another interesting note on that is that uh, later Romans would call prostitutes actors or actresses, which is actually pretty fitting. Anyways, in complete honesty, Romulus is one of the only kings of real note other than the last, you know, a man by the name of uh, Lucius Tarquinius Superbus, which means the arrogant. So Lucius Tarquinius the Arrogant, what a, what a mad lad. And uh, even the Republican Romans, myself included, given that, you know, I'm very partial towards late uh, Republic and early Empire, uh, they detested the idea of kings so greatly that the word for them, which for men would be rex, for women would be regina, uh, was used pejoratively. And an ex a notable example of this was when the divine Gaisar waylaid in Bithynia to secure a fleet. He spent so long there and returned with so many ships that his political rivals dubbed him Regina Bithyniae, which means the Queen of Bithynia. And on top of this, uh, Caesar's own soldiers during his triumph uh, began their chants with Gallias Caesar Subecit Caesarem Nicomitis, <laughs> which means Caesar conquered Gaul, Nicomitis conquered Caesar, being of course, Nicomedes IV of Bithynia. And, you know, this being spouted by his political rivals and even some of his own allies, you know, when he came back, it was it was great. Because he came back with, you know, a big fleet, and all they could really do was say, Ah, oh, look, Caesar, you, you, you took it, you big idiot, ha <laughs> ha, you know, take that fucking Cato Minor, you little bitch. Come on. Come on. Come at me. Anyways. After Romulus died, he the Senate that he created took a year of interregnum in order to, you know, decide who would become the next king. And this will happen a few other times, so I'll only explain this once. So what they would do is that they would share kingly powers for five days apiece until the year was over, and that was that. Congratulations. And then getting into it, the first king was a man by the name of Numa Pompilius. Now, Numa Pompilius was a Sabine, and, you know, kind of funny, right, you know, in, you know, Romulus's time, they went and they took all of, uh, you know, the Sabine women, well, I guess not all of them, but they took the Sabine women, and then, how funny that the next king, after the one who took their Sabine women, was a Sabine himself, but he was a good king. He ruled well, and he was actually a bit of a foil to Romulus, considering that his whole thing was peacemaking and piety. And following from this, he created several religious institutions which lasted until, you know, I guess like the 300s AD. But I'm not going to use uh, that uh, date measuring system anymore because... Uh, it's not needed. What, we're, what I'm going to use from here on out is called Ad Urbe Condita, which means from the founding of the city, which was, if you want to know, 753 BCE. Therefore, any time that I give after this point will be, you know, used 
as this time from the founding of Rome. So you just take whatever I say, uh, yeah, take 753 minus whatever I say, and bada bing, bada boom, you have the year. So, Numa Pompilius, back, back to him. He, and actually speaking of date keeping, he made the first Roman calendar, which it's kind of wonky. I'm not even going to just, I'm not even going to praise it. Uh, it's wonky. They had like, they had 10 months, 10 real named months, and they were 20, 30 days long, right? Their weeks were broken up into nine days on, one day off. Or actually, no. Yeah, nine days total, and one of those is off. Ah, there you go. And it was a, it was considered bad luck for the week to end on the first day of the year. So there was a lot of calendar finagling that they would have to do. But, you know, only having ten months of thirty days, you're probably asking yourself, what happened what happened to the other like, you know, sixty or whatever days? Well, what they would do is they would have one really long intercalendary month. And this really long intercalendary month was what was used to finagle the calendar so that, you know, people went into work on the first day of the year, on the first week of the year type thing. And they didn't come in on, like, you know, their Friday or they didn't come in on a Sunday or something like that, right? And, yeah, so that's pretty cool. Not only that, but he also instituted the office of the Pontifex Maximus, which was the chief priest in Rome. Now, this later on went to become, you know, the, the College of the Pontifex and that type of thing, and you would have, like, the people, uh, I guess you could call them, oh, I'm not even going to use religious terms, deacons, for whatever this means. Um, yes, those those people were called Flammai, and the Flammai were the people who, when the Pontifex was not in, you know, his place running the things, they were the people who would communally vote on what they would do in his place and they would also serve as you know people that uh, i guess a pool of candidates for the next pontifex they would aid the pontifex blah 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 blah. yes 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 religion religion fun yes and uh, as well as this he also started the college of the vestal virgins which is actually really cool because what they had there it was a weird little combination of things like so you hear the title vestal virgin right they were just required to be the virgin prior to joining, and then during their, I think it was 10 years, or now that I think about it, it's actually it's, uh, making me think that it's a lot longer, to several one to several decades worth of um, work as one of these people. They would have to remain a virgin through that time, and one of the things that was most interesting, I guess, about that is that if... And this actually happened at one point, though I forget the name of both the Vestal version and the guy who did it, but we'll just get into it. All right, this one dude goes, bangs one of the uh, Vestal virgins, and so they put both him, well, they put him to death, and then they kick the Vestal virgin out of the Vestal virgins, because he's no longer a virgin. Wah, wah. As well as the Temple of the Vestal virgins is where the Great Fire of Rome, or the Endless Fire of Rome, however you want to put it, was housed. In addition to this, they also held a lot of the abilities for wills. You know, they were the ones where you would inter your will, and then they would be the ones to give the will to whatever lawyer or whoever your designated heir is. And carrying on, Numa Pompilius also made the cults of Jupiter, Mars, and Romulus. Wonderful. You know, gotta, gotta start them early. Now, Numa Pompilius passed on, and the next king, which is third, is Tullus Hostilius. Now, given his last name of Hostilius, of course you think this comes from, or comes to, hostile. And that's what a lot of, you know, historians would think. And even Romans after that, they considered him, you know, very warlike. And for good reason. His grandfather served along Romulus during the Sabine War, of which I talked about in the last video, and he fought several. He fought that nice little little war himself, but we'll get into that. So he built the first Senate House of Rome, which is super cool, the uh, Curia Hostilia, after himself. 
naturally, right? You want to put your name on that thing, you know, like, you know, slap it on the front and yell branding at everyone. Uh, anyways, let's get into those, uh, let's get to that cool war stuff, because that's what he was most famous for, I guess. You know, being that he was both a mirror for Romulus's war making and a foil to Numa's peacemaking piety. So, he went to war with who else but the Sabines, you know, as this goes. So he fights with the Sabines, and at the Battle of Alba Longa, the city in which his, you know, his grandfather, uh, uh, I guess, well, the city, the city in which Romulus and Remus had, were, had been born in, you know, he goes back to it, and the two armies square off, they're like jeering at each other, and then he sends a messenger over to the Alba Longans, and he says, listen, let's choose champions. And auspiciously, there were two sets of triplet sons in each of the cities that were of comparable age enough to both be, you know, champions in this fight. And so they decided to pit them against each other. See who wins, you know? This is this is fate. This is destiny. Whoever wins here is the one who takes over Latium, is the one who becomes, uh, I guess, Rome. But, you know, if it, if it weren't Rome, then it would be Alba Longa. Ooh. <laughs> Coming up next, the Alba Longa Empire. It's pretty long. Um, anyways, so the the two triplets for the Romans, their set of triplets were from the house of Horati, and for the Alba Longans, it was the Curiati. Yes, it's double double T's. And when they were fighting, it was the Romans who came out on top. The Huriatii guy came came out on top, although the last brother standing out of these two sets of uh, triplets. Kind of a sad story. And it gets even worse, because the deal that they made that champion for was so that they wouldn't have to fight. You know, they wouldn't have to put their armies into the field and lose hundreds of dead. They'd only, in theory, lose five, like they did. But this wasn't this wasn't good for the dictator of Alba Longa. You know, he he wanted to win. He wanted his champions to go and kick the Romans. You know, he wanted to be the one who goes and takes over all of Europe. You know, and Metius Fufoetius. That's a that's a mouthful. Say try, uh, try to say that twenty times fast. Uh, he reneged on this deal. I mean, if, over the corpses of his own citizens that he made a deal over. He's like. Uh, you know, whatever, it's fine. We'll just, we'll just go back on that. And naturally, Hostilius, living up to his name, was like, um, no. Ran over there, beat the crap out of them, burnt their city to the ground, and took all their citizens back to the Aventine, threw them up on there, and threw them up into the apartments, and were like, ha, there you go, you citizens now, laters, you pores, and then walked out of there. And... You know, of course, it, this wasn't liked, of course, by the people who he, he did it to. But it doesn't matter, because now we're on to Anci Ancus Marcius, or Martius, depending on, you know, how you do it. But I like Marcius, that sounds even cooler. Anyways, he was the son of a guy named Marcius, you know. Surprise, surprise. And the Ancus part of his name just means bent, because one of his arms was screwed. And his mom was Pompilia, Numa Pompilius' daughter. Ooh, really cool, you know, grandson to one of the earlier kings, which is funny because the king before him was the, was, his grandfather was friends of Romulus, so he's the grandson friend of Romulus, and his, and the guy who came after Romulus is the grandson, it's, wow, you know, almost makes you think that the kings are made up, uh, hint, hint, yes, um, anyways, so, he, being Marcus, Marcus was like, you know what, we got the Numa, we got the Hostilius, why do we not have Numa Hostilius, am I right? And so he went with both of them at the same time, I don't know how you do peace and war at the same time, piety and vice, but he did it, I mean, props to the man, am I right? Like, let's talk about combining fire and ice in a way that doesn't put out the fire and doesn't melt the ice, you know? And so let's let's jump right into the war because you know boring is cool and we're gonna be talking about it a lot. So would you like to guess 
who Mr. Marquios went after in, in this in his first, you know, real combat. It was of course the Sabines. Good guess. And yes, it was also the Albalongus as well. <laughs> I mean, I guess these guys just run out of new ideas and are like, you know what? Whatever that last guy did, let's do it even better. So the people love me more and I get more coins made of me in the future. And you know, whatevs, he so he marched in, he depopulated a city called the Politorium and sent them to the Aventine, just like Hostilius did to the other Albalongans. And, you know, the uh, the city that, you know, Politorium that he had taken was just empty. He didn't raise it or anything. Like, un unlike, you know, Hostilius raising Albalonga to the ground. Irony, you know, the, the Latins noticing that this dude just left the city. They were like, Okay, we'll just go back in and repopulate it. Thanks. And Marcus was like, uh, no, 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 you, you can't do that. So he runs back in, he busts down the city walls, he depopulates it one more time, and he raises it to the ground. Ain't no coming back from that. You know, like when, in, uh, when Alexander completely destroyed Thebes. Ain't no Thebes anymore. <laughs> There's no going back. <laughs> and... Yeah, so, whoops, he just did that to them, but he wasn't done yet. He went after another city called Telenai, did the same thing. He went to a city after that named Ficana, and he did the same thing. And you know what? He rounded it all off with a little more protection from Rome, using all the loot that he had, to, well, I guess, lifted from the cities. He, uh, he built a fortified area... A fortified connection for a bridge across the Tiber from Rome, right across from the capital and across the Tiber, yeah, yeah, and on a hill called the, the Ianiculum, which is pretty neat. And one of the other things he did was he found at Ostia, which means mouth, because it was at the mouth of the Tiber River, and which is actually the main port from which Rome, for the rest well, pretty much, pretty much the rest of its life. That's the that's the place where all of its imports were first landed. That that was its customs agency right there. To put a you know modern modern spin on it, that's their customs agency right there. He founded that baby, you know. And so let's let's move into the religious aspects of his reign because he did a little bit. He um. He publicized Numa's commentaries, and he publicized the practices of the Pontifex Maximus in order for the people to become more pious themselves, and it worked. You know, later on in Roman's his, Roman history, they followed these practices so rigidly that if they made one small mistake in one of the rites, what they would do is they would start from the absolute beginning of the right and do it until they had done it perfectly all the way through and only then would they begin to do the thing that they had done the rights for i mean wow like showing up at like 6 a.m and waiting until about like three in the afternoon in order for the thing to actually start because someone kept messing up their lines <laughs> whoops f in the chat and yeah that was uh that was marcius and he goes out you know Wow, I'm gonna go to the next king, right? That's it. And the next king was a man by the name of Lucius Tarquinius Priscus. Keep those first two names in mind, because we'll come back to them. So, Tarquinius Priscus, when Marcius died, he was like, I'm gonna go to the Curiate Assembly, or Comitia Curia, and he, uh, he said to them, Look, Marcius' heirs, his sons, are still Babs. They're not even men yet. How can they? How can you vote on them to be king? And who would be king while they are still Babs, right? And the Curiates were like, you know, that's a smart idea right there. That's a that's a good question you bring up. So who would you think would be good? And of course, you know, like his grandson, spoiler, uh, was arrogant. And was like, me. And, were, and the curate assembly was like, hey, you know, good idea. And 
you know, I bet I bet you wonder, hey, Historia Romanos, wouldn't you speak up if, you know, you this is your birthright, and some dude just comes in in the 11th hour and takes it from you? I, I would be upset, you know. But here's the thing, uh, Marquios' heirs were supposedly on a hunting trip at the time couldn't speak out for themselves. And so Lucius Tarquinius Briscus just swept the king's the kingly crown right off the ground and stuck it on his head and was like, this is how we do it. And keep the keep the Marquian uh, heirs in mind. Keep the keep a little write, write it on a note card, slap it on your chest somewhere, we'll come back to it. So after this, you know, being that he had won over the Senate or the Curate Assembly, he was like, look I'm going to add an extra 100 seats to you guys to bring the total up to 300, which, you know, was the number that I had given in the last video. Whoops. You know, more more research, more more thinking. You realize you make mistakes. These things happen. Carrying on. Um, one of those seats, one of those 100 that he added, was an Octavius, or the birth family of Augustus. Really cool, you know. That's that's something to that's something to the, you know, I guess tell your grandchildren about, which he did in the Aeneid, which was commissioned on his behalf. So he did say it. Carrying on. So what? Do you, so what do you think? So what do you think, Mr. Lu Lucius Tarquinius Priscus did next, right? Think about think about the wars that the previous kings had done. Yeah, uh, yeah, you're right. It's the Sabines. Yep. Uh huh. He went to the war with the Sabines, and you know he goes into the Sabine lands. He beats their cities up, and he's like, "Bam, baby, this is how we do it." And takes his armies and the loot back to Rome. Well, the Sabines didn't like this very much, so they go on a um, punitive campaign against the Romans and five Etorian cities from Etruscia, or Tuscany today, were sending auxiliaries to them in order to assist against the Romans. Well, Tarquinius didn't take this sitting down, you know, he he fought really hard against them, and the Sabines actually made it into the streets of Rome, and, that, and in those streets of Rome, bloodied and covered in bodies and smelling of decay, that is where he was beaten and turned around. Well, not he, but the Sabines. And after that, he was like, you know what, these auxiliaries, and, you know, even later Romans would do this too, but, you know, there's a little bit of spoilers. He was like, you know, these auxiliaries, I'm going to imprison them. They helped our enemies, therefore they're our enemies too, you know. He who is a friend of my enemy is my enemy too. I, I think that's how the phrase goes. I don't know, you English speakers tell me. Those five cities that they come from, didn't take the sitting down either. They were like, hey man, you just locked up our people. Like, what are you doing? So we're going to go to war with you. We're going to show you what I, what we really do. Imagine what auxiliaries did to you. They sent you into your own city, man. Imagine what actual armies can do. And of course, these five cities were backed up by seven more Aturians. And they all go and fight on Rome. And one of the first things that the uh, Aturians capture was the city of Fidelna, which is in between Rome and the city of Wei. And, you know, all the fighting kind of centered around here, considering that it was so close to Rome. And it was also equally within marching distance of Aturia. You know, that's like a natural fold point for the front. And eventually... Tarquinius managed to push them over the edge and win. And here's the grand irony of him. He was Etruscan by nature. <laughs> Even, in fact, the name Lucius is supposedly coming from an Etruscan name Lucomo, or something like that. I don't know Etruscan. Uh, which, bam, Lucius. That's how you get that name. And... You know, also being Etruscan, he celebrated his triumph over the Etruscans in Etruscan garment, like an Etruscan king, with Etruscan symbolism. And then on top of this, he even introduced the Etruscan tuba to the military as a form of, you know, uh, musical alignment. Like, 
I guess, the marching armies of the Napoleonic era would have, like, you know, a band that accompanies to give them in a marching time. He did that with a trumpet. And, or I guess a tuba. Same thing. D a band members, don't please, please don't yell at me in the comments. They're the same thing in this time period. They're the same thing. They don't even have notes, they just blow it. Like, come on, what's the differentiation here? Carrying on. This dude, you know, uh, remember when I said that Markian's heirs would come back? Well, they came back, and they were old this time. They were ready to fight. They wanted their kingship. So what they did is they were like, look, we're going to start a riot. Force the king out of his palace to come down and try and reason with the people. And then... We're going to sling a rock at his head and crack it open. Their plan worked. But what they didn't plan for was Tarquinius' wife saying, Hey, he's actually still alive. And while, you know, all the people were sitting talking around about, you know, whether or not the king would die, she appoints a guy named Servius Dolius as Tarquinius' regent. And, of course, Servius Dolius takes over because... Tarquinius is already dead. <laughs> a master stroke by Tarquinius's wife. I mean, like, A+. Plus. I'll give her, give her a round of applause. Everyone, golf claps, golf claps. Um, yeah. So, moving on to the sixth king of Rome. We're almost there. I know I'm tired of talking of the kings, too. And I know you're tired of listening to them. Servius Tolius. His name, Servius, comes from Servis which means of the servants, or of the slaves. So he was servile in his upbringing or in his life. So, you know, one interesting thing, the story of how he was born. A disembodied phallus impregnated a virgin Roman slave, and from that, you know, his parents came from a conquered people, you know, and... He was born, and people decided that, look, his ancestry was an accident of fate, but his character and virtues are Roman. Therefore, he is a Roman, not a slave. But not everyone thinks that, you know. Like, damn. Everyone, like, if you do anything political in Rome, or even today, you'll eventually find yourself getting lambasted for some things that you have absolutely no control over. I mean, what's the point? But that's what that's what people do. If they find an edge in that can, you know, make you look worse than you is, then they go and do it. So, carrying on. One of the things that bears his name is the Servian reforms. Although, what the Servian reforms were was actually started under Marcius and didn't really end until the end of the Republic. So, did he really even do it? His name is on it, so... But what is it? This is what it is. So, when there were people who would be able to vote for representation in the Curate Assembly, or the Coria Comitia, he decided that it w shouldn't just be the rich. You know, normally it had been the most prestigious families, you know, the patricians that I had mentioned, the original founding members of the first senate, which comes from senex, meaning old man. So the, their oldest living member, supposedly the most wise, would go into the senate. And what he, what he did was say, you know, it shouldn't just be the rich people who have representation. It should also be the urban poor, and it should also be the poor landowning. So, they were able to get votes. And the way that this was done was done through what was called the Centuriate Assembly, or, you know, Comitia Centuriata. Yeah, so the Centuriate Assembly broke down everyone by class, and then inside each class, they broke down each of them into groups of 100. And the way which, in the Republic, which I'll get more into when we get to the Republic, 
the way that this was done was that the most rich of them would vote first and they would go block by block by block by block until one of them w until one of the people that they were electing had a majority and then when they had the majority the voting would stop so you can easily see how all the rich people who vote first can just say I don't know stand all stand behind one guy and vote only him and bada bing bada boom there's nothing the poor can say and they had to stand in line for pretty much the whole day and sometimes it would even take multiple days to do this so these people were you know losing all their money not being able to go to work and most of the urban poor you know people who had jobs just didn't vote entirely you, they'd be wasting their time you know they better get money in order to pay for their stuff they can vote at a different time you know who cares and it was and the only people who showed up for the actual poor vote which was very very rarely ever called on were the people who were so poor that they didn't even have a job well, the Romans did. They called them poor. Plebes. They, they don't got any money. Bring it. Bring it right back to the story of his servile origins. You know, uh, he married two of he married two of his daughters to two of Tarquin's sons. One of which was named Lucius Tarquinius. Remember what I said to remember the name? Yes. Lucius Tarquinius. Lucius Tarquinius Superbus is how he would be known later. Lucius Tarquinius the Arrogant. And so these, so Lucius and the um, Tolia that he married uh, decided to overthrow Servius Tolius. You know, for whatever reason. They wanted power, I guess. And so what they did is the, the, the younger Tarquin rose up on the Rostra, which was the speaking platform in in the Senate, and he started disparaging, you know, Servius Dolio, saying, you know, you were born a slave, your mother was a slave, you lie about, you know, your dad being divine or whatever, it, that just means your mom's a prostitute, so what are you going to do about it, big man? <laughs> and so, of course, Servius Dolio comes out and he's like, hold on. Why, why, why are you yelling at me like this? Why are you making fun of me, man? I married you to my daughter. I trust you. I want you to be my friend. You're the, you're the son of the guy who gave me my position. And Lucius Tarquinius puts his hand on his shoulder and is like, you know, you're so right. And then just shoves him down the stairs and points at his armed guard and is like, kill him. And they do. Bada bing, bada boom. Lucius Tarquinius Superbus is the new king. And... Lucius Tarquinius Superbus before the body of Servius Tolius was even cold, he says, do not bury him. And then he immediately sent out for the executions of everyone loyal to Tolius. Like, wow. You know, later Romans will talk about, like, the prescriptions of Sulla. They'll talk about the prescriptions of Marius. They'll talk about the prescriptions of Octavius and Antonius. You know, but... This is where it all started, really. And I guess this is why he is the seventh and final king of Rome. So, what does he do? Who do you think he goes to war with first? Huh? Let's put put your bets in. Let's come on, we only got 30 say I, he, he didn't fight the Sabines. You're all wrong, he didn't fight the Sabines. He fought the people named the Wolski, and he fought the Gabii. He won against the Wolski. I'm not even going to talk about it because boring the Gabii one is interesting so he tried to fight the Gabians and he was unable to take their capital city so what he did his sixth born son evidenced by his name Sextus sixth Sextus Tarquinius he sent him to you know just pretend to defect to the Gabians talk about like high IQ over here because it worked it's like a tr it's like it's like in the Iliad you know the Trojan horse this dude is like look I'm gonna work with you guys and the Gabians are like you know what we like you sex this why don't you be the ru why don't you command their armies and he was like wow that's very nice of you I would gladly will 
and immediately sent a letter over to his father saying, hey, how do I take the city now? I got their army. And when the messenger read this to Lucius, Lucius was walking around the garden, and he didn't say anything in reply. But what he did is he took his walking stick and thwacked the heads off of poppies as he was walking past, picking out the tallest. The messenger got the message, sent it to Sextus, who also understood. And so he executed all the people of any prominence and sent them off to the Aventine, just like all the kings before him. Now, you can see why I said that the Aventine was full of the poor, because they sent the people who had all their belongings taken from them there. Isn't exactly conducive to having a an area of which you know you'd have a lot of financial stability. But carrying on, he won. Bada bing, bada boom, baby. That's that's what's important. Now let's talk about some interesting like construction things he did, like flattening the Tarpian rock, named after the Tarpeia, who uh, was the woman who stood up on the ramparts during the Sabine War and yelled down at their fathers and were like, hey, stop fighting, we don't want to lose our husbands and their dads, then we cry. So they stopped fighting. Yeah, that was the rock that she did it from. He flattened it, and it later became a spot to execute people. Ironic. Um... He also dug out the area for the Cloaca Maxima, which is the Great Sewer, which... Uh, so, the what, what this did, I don't want to make it seem like I'm making a commentary on American politics, but at the same time, yes, I absolutely am. So, the Cloaca Maximus was originally done to drain the swamp that was in the middle of Rome. <laughs> so, you could say he actually did what American politi politicians claim to do and can't. And he was deposed for it. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Wonderful. Carrying on. This is the most interesting story, I think, other than his overthrow, of his reign. Which was, one of the Sibyls came up to him with nine books at an exorbitant price. And Lucius Tarquinius turned her away. So, she went back, burned three of the books... Return the next day with six, at the same price. Tarquinius thought about it, turned them away again. So, she went back, burned three more books, returned with the final three. To which Tarquinius was like, oh, this, this might be important. And so he finally puts forward the money and takes them. And this is where we get the Sibylline books. The prophecy of the life of Rome. Imagine if he went for it the first time. Rome would still be around. Anyways, that was the last important thing that he did, other than let Lucius Brutus come in and punch the shit out of him so he could get out and get overthrown and send out to the Anturians. Congratulations, you made it, you stupid Sabine. Now get the heck out of here. Get out of here. And that is the end of the kingships of Rome. And... As always, remember, Rome is light, Rome is love, Rome is peace, Rome is war. Rome is eternal, Rome's glory may never perish. Believe in it, and it shall continue. Have a good night.